Crystal Crawford, and I'm a certified uh, access consciousness facilitator. And I'm here today with Maxine Hurley. Hi, Maxine. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Crystal. <laughs> so if the dynamic seems a little odd, Maxine and I have been friends for about three years, and um, we this is our first hangout together, and so we're really excited to be bringing this to you. The the hangout today is really about uh, access bars and the change that you can create in your life and in your body when you actually start to use them. And Maxine, I'm going to get you to tell some of your story, but to give everybody a little bit of a heads up. When when I met Maxine, she was on her way up from a on her way up from a journey with fibromyalgia that I don't think she would probably call a journey. <laughs> Um, and we got into this conversation that day while I was working at a garden center about a book called Wheat Belly. And both of us were really into nutrition and what it could create in our bodies from two totally different points of view. Mine from more of the sport and athletic point of view and hers from a, a, a bringing her body back from the brink of, of, of a disease. And so through the time that we've known each other, access access consciousness came into my life and um, I introduced the bars into my life and then into Maxine's life and she's taken it and run with it in a way that I'm really thankful for and really excited about and so Maxine I just wanted to get you to talk a little bit about kind of where you were I guess when we met and, and what what fibromyalgia was doing to your body and and where you were at when you finally made a choice or, or, or started to create something different for you and your body. Can you tell us a little bit about the before? When I first, when met, I first met you, Crystal, you, Crystal I, was I was at the, at the end of a 13 years. Anyways, this is really, this is really distracting. distracting. However, however, 13 years. 13 years. I've been, I've been pretty much. Pretty in much in it. Um, um, I've lost, I've lost most everything. Most everything. Uh, my physical my strength, physical strength, my ability my to ability think. To think. Um, um, it was pretty, much, was a pretty much a mobile. Or or the better part of the better part of um, um, I had no I energy. Had no energy. Strength. strength. I was I ill. Was digestion was bad. Kidney stone. Everything. 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 Constantly, constantly pain. pain. I didn't sleep. I, didn't sleep. I couldn't think. Um, it was up. It was a terrible, terrible place. I lost my ability to care for myself. I, I had no desire to live. I had no desire to kill myself. I didn't have strength to do much of anything. However, there were days when I would wake up and and just wished I hadn't. So when I met you, I was starting to come out of it. I'd had a bit of an aha moment one day at my cottage, and I don't know what happened, but a voice whispered to me. And I think at that moment, uh, I, was, I was ready for, to hear something. I was incapable of hearing anything prior to that. It just was a, it was a sinking ship. <clears throat> And so I think I, I don't think I wanted to die. I think my body didn't want me to die. But if I had pursued the line I was traveling for much longer, my physical body would have died. I know that. So that's where we were when I walked in for a load of mulch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So give me some of that peat moss and a load of that mulch. <laughs> and so uh, you mentioned that your mother had fibromyalgia, and I think that's how the wheat belly came into it. The wheat belly for me was was a was another straw. I was grasping it actually. I had tried vitamin therapy and had moderate success with that. I had I tried many many things to try and and uh, get some strength back, get some pain out of my body, whatever. <laughs> And uh, wheat belly was was the last of a uh, the last thing I tried, and it actually gave me some relief in that I think I did have, as many of us do, 
um, an intolerance to the uh, to the GMO wheat that North America is subjected to right now. And so when I found that and made took uh, took wheat and wheat gluten out of my diet, it's, I started to feel physically a little better. Mentally, I was still in the toilet. I was pretty much a wreck. Uh, but it was it was a step. It was something I could measure. It was uh, something concrete. So I started there. And um, and that gave hope. And hope is a funny thing in fibromyalgia. It's it's um, I used to actually weep on a good day. Good days were were the worst thing I could have because a good day came out of nowhere, and you had a good day, and you were pain free, and you slept, and you could think. And you knew it was going to end. And you don't know, you did not know what started it. So a good day just was like a tease that said to you, see, this is what you can't have. And so a good day was probably worse than anything. Um, because you didn't know what the good day was. It, it was not a good thing. I, at some point, began to piece together that there were many, many contributors to this set of symptoms. And I likened it at one point to um, 12 wheels on a slot machine. I had managed to identify maybe six or seven of them. And so that uh, if six or seven came up, it wasn't a good day, but it wasn't a real bad day but I sort of knew what they were. There was barometric pressure. There was, I didn't sleep, sometimes the full moon, um, things like that. My thyroid, things like that. Uh, but the other, the other six, I didn't know what they were. So I had no control over them. I had no knowledge of what, what was precipitating things. And, but I always believed it wasn't just one thing. And I never, I, I never really wanted to buy into the fact that this was going to be my lot. Even even as I was sliding down a, a slope that was heading for the biggest shit pile in the world, I, I, I did not want to believe that that's all it was going to be. I'd had such a full life prior to that, a, pu a full physical life, a, a, a life of strength and joy and movement. And, and I had a job that required my mind to be sharp. I was involved in medical research. I was a clinical technologist in a neonatal intensive care unit. I had the lives of tiny babies in my hands. I mean, there was so much that was just gone. And so it was a horrible, horrible place to be. And the most, at the end um, of this 13 year business of inactivity and inability to move, I even began to lose my ability to think. I remember saying to a friend of mine that thinking was like trying to move through water. I, I had, I'd lost language. I had lost my ability to speak freely. I had lost my ability to think quickly. My mind was going. My mind was going. It was awful. So I think when I met you, I think there'd been a little uptick in things. But I still was precariously close to actually physically dying, I think. I think had I continued on much longer, um, your body gives up, you know. And, and so I was willing to try a number of things. I did, thanks to you, go see um, a woman, I forgot, Ashna Starrett, um, and she and, and it's a modality I'd never heard of, and I didn't believe in any of it. And, and but I went, and helped clear me of of specifically anger. There was a huge bubble of anger that I carried with me, that I had been searching for years to find out why, because it was so inherently not me. But there it was, and it dwelt within me, and and it was consuming me. And, and as was the journey to try and find out what it was. I had examined every inch of my life again and again and again and again and then again, and then maybe from another angle. 
So when that was taken care of, that, and she did, it just left. One session with her and boom, it was gone. It, it was gone because she said, is it that? And I said, oh, yes, it is. And so I could get rid of it. I didn't have to examine it anymore. I didn't have to go looking for it. And it was in the summer, I think, of um, 2013 that you uh, came to see us here in London and said, I really want to go see uh, this person about access consciousness. Uh, and me being me, of course, I went and researched it out the other end of whatever and said, what a load of crap. <laughs> Nonsense. Uh, this, this stuff can't work. And and what what brought me to it was the effect that I saw it having upon your life. I didn't think there was anything in it for mine because I didn't think there was anything much in any in of anything in my life at that point. Right. And so um, I think I dithered along for another year almost while you went ahead and uh, and took training and did stuff and got your shit together. <laughs> and, um, I was I was busier, I think, at that time, trying to get my physical life together. Right. And uh, through diet and through trying to get some sleep, and and it, there were little little. I was making tiny steps, tiny steps, but it was still precariously close to being able to relapse. I finally took myself away on walkabout at the beginning of two thousand and fourteen. Uh, to be by myself and to, to, and to find some healthy climate as well. And so I, I took myself to the West Coast for five months and sat and looked at the, uh, the ocean and ate well and slept well. And I found that the, uh, the clear air and the sleep did more than I could ever imagine to begin to, to get me to some point. And I was, again, I was nearly immobile. I, I needed a cane to walk, and steps were almost impossible, and there was no stamina. But it, it the rest of it was coming together. Anyway, long story short, came back after five months there, um, a changed person, but uh, still physically precarious. And mentally, mentally I was better, but, it, you know, that's better is a, is a relative term. You were in kindergarten. I was at my cottage, so I went started going to see you once a week for drinks and dinner. And oh, by the way, here let me run your bars. <laughs> it was my ploy. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, "Well, I want you to run them for four hours." And you said, "Why?" And I said, "Because I've been reading." Uh, <laughs> And uh, I read an article where a man had a done ran his had his bars run for an hour and it did nothing. He was and he trashed it, trashed it into the ground. And of course, that's the first one that pops up when you Google something. <laughs> but uh, diligent as I am, I kept reading. And and this man went back and he said, "Okay, maybe one hour wasn't enough." So he went back and asked for four hours and came out and and wrote an entirely different shift to it so I said I want four hours and you said I can't do four hours <laughs> and besides we had other things to talk about and and so I well, I left that thing and I thought well that didn't do anything I can't feel anything yeah. um, and I didn't and so once a week uh, while I was at the cottage I went up and we did that and I still never felt anything you know but I began to feel easier life began to feel easier and uh, I began to feel easier. Um, I don't know how to describe that except that um, there was more ease in my life. Uh, the loops weren't running quite so much. Loops in that um, I, w I had the capability when I could think to go back to conversations 30 years ago and run the whole thing verbatim and, and probably accurately. Uh, but what was the point to that? You know, there was obviously stuff in my head that I wanted to, to straighten out because uh, that's sort of what I do. I go and I fix and I straighten out and stuff. And then the, the more we began to talk about it and the more I began to actually hear something, was that with the bars, you don't 
have to sort it out and you don't have to relive it and you don't have to go back there and reanalyze it and you don't have to spreadsheet it and you don't have to do all of this stuff. And I heard it say, oh, it deletes like a folder that just deletes it. And I went, oh, thank God, because I really don't want to read these again. <laughs> I've been reading these for 45 years and they're boring and I still don't want to see them anymore, but they're in there. Uh, so I think what began to happen is uh, we began to delete a few things and a few things more and, and a few things more. And actually, when you asked me to do this Hangout, and it was, this, it was I think it was a couple of months ago when you suggested it, and I said, well, sure, all right, I can do that. I can. And in the two months since then, and going once a week to see uh, my person here in London, and having my bars run once a week, I'm having trouble resurrecting some of this stuff. Yeah. I really can't remember the specifics. Right, and I and just to give whoever's watching kind of a heads up about what the bars are, like if you're watching this for the first time, what Maxine's saying is that the bars are 32 points on your head. There's 32 different spots that you just, whoever's running your bars gently places their hands on, fingers on very lightly. And, and like, um, cleaning up your hard drive on your computer, it just simply deletes old files. Mm -hmm. And it's really funny because I, I have a, a really great friend in my life and, and sometimes he calls me the Irish setter because I'm just like, you know, just just happy. Like a, a lot of ease and there isn't the, the constantly running mind chatter in my head that there was before and I'm not fretting like I was before and I'm not worrying about things like I was before and I don't have to, just like you said, I don't have to analyze everything to death like I did before. And for me, and I, I'm curious about what it is for you now, but you know, like I used to get chronic headaches from from worrying and from stress. And that isn't fibromyalgia, but but fibromyalgia kind of does run in my family. Like my mom, you know, she's a chronic uh overanalyzer and and worrier and stress and and things like that. And and as I've been getting more into access and these tools and, and having my bars run and getting to this different space, I've been able to look at her and what she struggles with quite a bit differently. And, and I really do wonder, you know, if she, similar to what you're experiencing, you know, like if she actually let somebody run her bars, what that would change for her and her body. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, I mean, we talk about sometimes how they're linked, but I get how it would seem odd that um, a physical body process like that, that where you're talking about, well, it deletes mind chatter, could then associate itself with reduced body pain. So can you talk about what that's been like for you? And, and what? Yeah, actually, uh, with, with Mary this afternoon, I was, I was speaking to that uh, we were going to be doing this thing. And, and, and I shared with her that when I was deep in the throes of fibromyalgia symptoms, and I'll say right now, I would, I, right now I'm classifying myself as being free of fibromyalgia symptoms. Wow. I'm free from those. I have intensities. I have things. But those are specific to specific body parts, and I can look at them and identify them. And I had an, a, an active athletic life prior to this. So some of it is just stuff. But I, I will not – I'm not – in the throes of fibromyalgia any longer. Wow. If anything, I have beaten this thing or, or whatever. However, the most insulting thing that anyone can say to a somebody who's in the midst of chronic pain mm -hmm. is, is, is that it's in your head. Right. It is, it is insulting beyond belief because the pain is beyond anything anyone can imagine. It is constant, it is encompassing, it is awful, it is non-alleviated by medication unless they shut your mind down. Right. For me, I would say 98% of it came from my, was mental, in that uh, life just became a whole lot for me. Yeah. I shut I was aware of absolutely everything and at a very early age took on a whole lot of everything. And I think for me, the shut, the shutting down of awareness, it, it was initiated years and years and years and years ago, little by little, by little, by little, by little, until the point where you take your own 
awareness of you, yourself, and your surroundings, and your competency, and your everything, and you turn off the switch. And for me, I'll speak only to myself, I think my body was screaming at me as loud as it could. Yeah. Through the intensities of every part of my body. I don't mean the war wounds from playing sports. I mean this migratory pain that was here, it was there, it was nothing. It kept, it, I didn't sleep, I didn't eat, I didn't move, I barely breathed, I didn't drink water, I was killing myself. Yeah. Because mentally I was catatonic, I was nearly moribund. And my body was not ready to die. And it was screaming at me, screaming at me. Yeah. It was the only thing left to get my attention. Now that I'm just speaking to me. This is how I have later since come to look at it all. And if somebody seven years ago had come to me and I had a dear friend who kept me alive. She brought me food. She did my laundry. She said, please go take a shower because you're beginning to smell. I mean, it was awful. Where I was, was, it was a terrible place. Uh, but I was there. Anyway, if she had said to me, Maxine, do you think maybe you need to talk to somebody because this is in your head? She, mm -hmm. I'd probably be in Kingston because I'd have killed her. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, it would have been, I would have reacted so badly to it because the it's in your head business is such a demeaning thing that's said in this thing. It's you're mentally ill. Well, you're not mentally ill, but you got so much stuff going on up there. I've heard you use the term loop, and until I heard that, I never really knew what that meant. And it's eternal loops, and again, and again, mm -hmm. and again, and again. And even when you're sleeping, you're not sleeping. And if they give you medication for the pain to stop the pain, then the loops don't stop. They just stop. They, they don't go away. They just stop for a minute. Right. And then when you wake up, they start again. For me, bars got rid of some of the loops. Yeah. And then I got rid of more of the loops. And I don't have to think about them anymore because there's no rethinking them. I, I was re trying to figure out things 45 years ago to fix them. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> and if I did figure them out, what was I going to fix? Right. Everyone's dead. <laughs> I know. And it's, it's really, I mean, the way we're taught is you go in and you find the root of the, you got to dig for the root of the problem and then you dig out the root of the problem and then you don't have a problem anymore but it, it never ends it kind of I, I describe it to people it like keeps you in this cyclone of you know just craziness like you get you get relief for a second but then you're back in the cyclone again and my favorite thing about bars and I'm, I'm having an exchange at my house tonight where we're all going to just swap them but my favorite thing is like you don't have to figure anything out and the thing about us as energetic beings and then the subsequent dance between our bodies and our beings is that energy doesn't require words it just yeah. requires attention it just requires acknowledgement it just requires us to do something with it mm. and, and when we're not taught that we're an energetic being you know when we're we're in this functional reality of you know relationships and family and all of these things that we're taught and points of view that we're taught you know we're not we don't, we aren't really equipped with the tools of an energetic being. And, and as an adjunct to that, I would say for me, mm -hmm. um, what, what bars has allowed me to do is it's gotten, it's, 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 it's deleted stuff that serves me no purpose. Right. And with that gone, then I can have a look at me. And quite frankly, I'm very interested in me yeah. and what makes me tick. I'm an energetic being, but I'm here in this realm, in this thing to discover me. Absolutely. And so when you, and, and have some of it make sense, um, he, instead of going, why, how did that happen? I'm, I'm a person that I really would like to know how it happened. 
I don't really want to beat myself up about it, but the how of it happening will always bubble up for me. And with the superfluous gone, the bubble up comes and I look at it and I go, oh yeah, yep, that's how it happened. And I can tuck that to one side. If you're a person who doesn't care how it happened, not interested, good, then you will never have to deal with it. But for me, uh, the bars has freed me up to, to deal with uh, some things the way I like to deal with them, it, to know the why. Of yeah. Some. And can you just, the, the only other thing I think that people, that I'm really thankful for with you being who you are is, is there aren't a lot of, I mean, ours is an unlikely friendship for a lot of reasons, but the primary reason being our age difference. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember you and I have had conversations about that from, you know, we'd get into this whole dialogue of like, well, it's a generational point of view or a generational mm -hmm. gap and, and things like that. and and one of the things that I've, as I've watched you change and, and get more freedom with your body and, and as we've had more conversations as friends, you're the age that at the age that you are, most people aren't choosing to do something different. Mm. A lot of people are choosing, well, a lot of people don't know. So uh, if you were to talk to, you know, your generation and to your your people that sounds silly but like what would you say what what would you say what would your well, message be i don't know <laughs> i had this conversation a couple of weeks ago and uh, and uh, and uh, my friend mary said to me how many 70 year olds do you know that uh, want to change and i came away from that thinking i don't know if 70 year olds 70 plus year, year olds even know there's an option um i don't know if they do um I, I don't have children. I, I'm not a grandmother. Uh, I'm, I've never been married. Uh, I've, I've raised children. I've been an, a sister, a, a, a aunt to 10 people. I've, I've done. So my life isn't actually devoid. I don't have the husband factor, which uh, throws a spanner into the works, I think, sometimes, unless you've got a really supportive guy. But if, you're, if you were a woman in her 70s, who is looking at her life and going, wow. And you've got Harold sitting next door with his hat on sideways and he wants Maud just exactly the way she is, then she's got problems that I could never begin to address. But I think that if for one moment you think there's something more, there is. <laughs> and if and I, I, I sound like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking like that. I'm never going to talk like this. If you do nothing, go get them run once a week for a month. You're going to feel better. Better being a relative thing. I'll tell you where, so I'm 72 years old and here I am and I want, I want my life to change now. And, and it's going to, and it is, and that's all there is to it. And it can, and it, you find your own places to change and how you're going to feel better. But if you are in the midst of a disease like fibromyalgia or a chronic pain, um, anything, uh, and even if it's, if it's a, if it's a medical diagnosis of specific things, I mean, fibromyalgia is so vague. All of these chronic syndromes of pain syndromes are so vague. It's it, what they're essentially saying is, yeah, you have pain, uh, but we don't want to know what it is. <laughs> uh, so here, take this pill and, and, and do that. Well, go do something for yourself. And this would be a place to start. But since in the last six months, since I started to, to come out of this with a vengeance, I've been running into more and more and more 55-year-old women yeah. who have been given 40-year-old women who said, yes, well, I was just diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and it's like an oh well. And I looked at one and said, do you realize that you've got 35 years ahead of you in this if you just sit and take this thing? Yeah. But you have to, you have to have somebody, you have to have somebody who who you believe that you have trust in to be able to give you this information. Yeah. And, and I think you have to kind of trust, like you said, you, you also just have to kind of trust your sense that there's gotta be something else. Yeah. 
Cause like for me, I, when I, like when I stumbled on access, I didn't know the people that were running my bars <laughs> and it, it didn't really require as much, you know, like one-on-one -on -one knowledge of them as I did a knowing that there was, there was a light, like a lightness there. There was something there for me mm -hmm. and I did, I did not trust these people. So it was okay. So it's really for, like, trust yourself. Like if you are struggling with chronic pain or fibromyalgia and, and you know there's something else, there is. There's, it's worth a shot. It's worth a try. Yeah, and I, I, I go ahead. I think I really didn't understand until I started to come out of the fibro symptomology how I railed against it. Mm -hmm. and, but the harder I railed, the deeper I seemed to go. But it, for right. me, it was just I was just railing against one more thing. But this was going to kill me. I knew this was going to kill me as in, in the ground, kill me. Yeah. Um, and it feels like that when you're in there. And the only thing that kept me, I think, from not getting in the ground is I wasn't I didn't want to somewhere. I didn't want to at all. Um, and you've, you've got to understand that this was 15 years ago when I was first received the diagnosis. And back then it was really just all in your head. It was all just a, a fabric of your imagination. There, was, there, wasn't a, there were very few doctors who didn't give you anything for the pain, uh, any kind of pain. Uh, now, now big pharmaceuticals are in on it because of Lyrica and a number of other things. So now we've got a diagnosis. Right. We'll even soon probably have a laboratory testing method for two or three of them that will ascertain for sure that you've got this because then they'll be able to give you another drug. Exactly. And I, your experience with, with drugs and this, I think you touched on it earlier, but did you find that it was effective or... My, I, had a do I had a wonderful doctor. She wouldn't give me anything. Mm. She gave me something to help me sleep, a tiny, tiny little uh, pill of five milligram, whatever, because she said, you've got to sleep. But I re I'm not going to be giving you um, um, antidepressants, which was at that time what was being prescribed because you were depressed. She mm. says, I'm not giving that to you. So that when I was very fortunate in that, Whatever mood I was in, I was only in that mood because of me. I wasn't in because I was a, I was I had some drug in my system, but that was not the case for a lot of people that I know. Right. And so, would you say, like, if you were going to do like a scale of one to ten on like where your body was at even six months ago and where it's at now, is there a big difference? It's a huge difference. There's an absolute huge difference in that. Um, my chiropractor thinks I'm incredible. Uh, <laughs> I think are. I'm pretty incredible. I, <laughs> uh, when, when I think of where I was a year ago, I was just coming home from um, the, the five months on Vancouver Island, and I could barely walk. I could walk better. Uh, I still, uh, no, actually, I, I could barely walk. I, I sucked it up. Not many people knew it was as bad as it was. Mm -hmm. But that's what you do when you have a thing with chronic pain. You suck it up, and, and you, for, for an hour and a half or two or three hours, you look really good because you really don't want people going there, there, and all that kind of thing. Six months ago, a year ago, let's flatline me at, um, let's put me at, let's make that the X, Y axis. Starting there, six months ago, 25%. Mm -hmm. I think I'm at least 60% now. Wow. Um, and that's, that's because for, th for 13 years, 12 years, I didn't move. This is, this is a difficult thing to get people to understand. They go, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I go, no, you don't really. Immobile. I moved from the couch to the bathroom, from the bathroom to my couch, from my couch to my bed, and that was the triangle I did. And, the, and it got worse. And it was, became all I could do. So for me, in a year to come from almost not being able to walk to where I am now, yeah, I figure maybe I should go in the, uh, I don't know, Iron Man, maybe I'm looking at. <laughs> I just 
heard of a woman who, who <laughs> ran her first marathon at 77, and I thought, wow, what a woman. Good for her. I don't think so. But you know what I mean. It's, yeah. Yeah. I, and I would attribute... Um, I would attribute at least a full third to the bars. Actually, chiropractic was great. Then I added massage therapy to it. And the sum of those two parts was more than just the two parts. Together, they gave me more. Right. When I added the bars into it, it exploded. Wow. So, and I still don't feel anything <laughs> when the bars are being run. <laughs> Well, I'm so grateful for this conversation. Thank you so much for choosing to share all of that with us. I'm, I'm so grateful for you. Well, I hope, uh, I hope it will help someone. Don't yeah. sit there. Don't sit there and wonder. Go do something. There's always a choice. Absolutely. And for those of you watching, if you're looking for bars practitioners or facilitators in your area, you can go to www.accessconsciousness.com and you can search your city and your state for a practitioner near you. So there's bars practitioners, bars facilitators, and certified facilitators, and they all do bars. So thank you so much, Maxine. I'm so grateful. And what do I do now? I, I think we're just going to say goodbye. Okay. And I just hang up with the little phone. <laughs> the little phone. All right. Thanks, you guys, for watching. We'll talk Have to you Have a nice soon. night. Bye.